Well, good to see you all. Glad you could stay. Um, I'm here. My name is Patrice Petra. I'm here with uh, Tim Corrigan, uh, Emeritus Professor of English and Cinema Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. So let's, shall we? Get going, yeah. Okay, we've just seen Ali Firid's The Soul, and I wanted to start with a quote from Fassbinder himself. And Fassbinder has said, and I quote, the best thing I could think of would be to create a union between something as beautiful and powerful and wonderful as Hollywood films and a critique of the status quo. That's my dream, to make such a German film, beautiful and extravagant and fantastic, and nevertheless go against the grain. Does Fassbinder achieve this union in the film we've just watched? Um, I would say he's getting there. It's, um, it reminds me of a story which I don't think is apocryphal, but um, um, someone ran into him on the streets of Greenwich Village at one point, and um, they said, aren't you a friend of Anna Fassbinder? They said, no, 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 he's much too famous to be around here. And he, he, he did have this real um, dream and desire to become, to win an Oscar, actually, as he said at one point or other. And um, so I think that, in a way, what you see happening here is, is, in some ways, moving in that direction, specifically through the vehicle of melodrama, which he saw as maybe the heart of you know, great Hollywood films. I think in terms of the kind of lavishness of the big, beautiful Hollywood uh, film, uh, you see that later in the 70s, when it gets to films like um, The Marriage of Maria Braun, um, and you know the Bay Day Art trilogy with uh, Lola and Veronica Voss, um, and in a way I see this as in some ways a kind of middle period film for Fassbinder, you know, coming out of the '60s, the late '60s, and his so-called anti-theater films, which are much more in some ways um, associated with a kind of new wave Brechtian aesthetic, um, moving through this middle period where he's trying to integrate that kind of Brechtian aesthetic into a more melodramatic formula, um, and then moving forward into what I say is the, the final phase, where he's actually, because he has the resources to actually make these bigger budget films, he has his, his team has become a team of stars, you know, not just in Germany, but certainly in Europe with Hannah Schigula and other people as well, um, that he can really, in some ways, exaggerate or uh, build on that melodramatic formula um, which becomes, you know, a way of, and I think at the heart of, of what he's doing, uh, is trying to integrate uh, a kind of Brechtian aesthetic into a melodramatic Hollywood aesthetic. Um, and I think that's already taking shape in this film. Hmm. Well, how would you locate Fassbinder's film within a larger process of critical evaluation in which Cirque's entire body of work has been rediscovered and, and reappraised by successive generations of historians and makers. I mean, like Todd Haynes, who also, as we were talking about, we have um, Cirque with all that heaven allows in 1955, here in 74, nearly 20 years later, Ali Fear eats the soul, then 2002, Todd Haynes, far from heaven, because we're clearly far from heaven. <laughs> um, but what do you think, you know, how would you locate his work within this reappraisal of Cirque? Um, I, I think, um, I mean, that's a, it's a complicated question because I've talked with people about this, and, and of course, sort of independent of Fassbinder, uh, this reappraisal of Cirque um, has wanted to see him as someone who um, already is in some ways introducing a kind of critical perspective within that melodramatic formula. Uh, and then there are others who are saying that's kind of overreading Cirque at that point. Um, and you know, I'm not quite sure myself where I would place it. I mean, I think of films like the Cirque film, um, All That Heaven Allows, or something like Imitation of Life, which he does later, is you know, very much a kind of social critique at the same time, that it's a melodrama. But I'm not sure I find it as, um, um, as edgy, as, as uh, critical, as a lot of people make out Cirque in retrospect in that way. You know, I, I think I can see the, the, the traces of that certainly in there. And of course, Cirque was German. So in a way, there's a way of seeing, you know, Cirque as a German coming in some ways, transforming himself into a Hollywood filmmaker. 
And if you want to sort of make this a kind of simplistic formula, in a way, it's if Cirque sees himself as coming to the US in the 50s and in some ways integrating himself quite efficiently and his European sensibility into a Hollywood formula, there's a sense in which Fassbinder, that other Germany, German, is trying to, in some ways, transform Hollywood through his German perspective at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in a way, it's, it's interesting to see the way in which Fassbinder's use of that kind of critical melodrama, the way it spreads around the world after him. And of course, there are filmmakers like Amadovar, who's entirely, I think, um, um, related to the kind of work Fassbinder was doing. Warkar Y as well, and other people as well. Well, getting to the film itself, it's interesting that Fassbinder's working title was Allah Turk in Heisen Ali, All Turks Are Named Ali, suggesting that Ali's experience is generalizable and that Turks are, in, in effect, both foreign and black. Ali is North African and not Turkish, um, and in 1973, the top three guest worker nationalities in German were, in order, Turkish, Italian, and Yugoslavian. So if one of the film's objectives is to generalize Ali's experience, why not make Ali typical rather than exceptional? I mean, why invite the confusion of race and nationality, or is that intentional? Um, I, th I think it is, in, in a sense. I think. Um, there's a way in which, you know, early in the film, you know, he says, this is my real name, yes. but everyone calls us Ali. So there's a sense in which I think he's generalizing the kind of racism that Ali represents. So whether you're Turkish, Northern African, or whatever, if you're not German, you're going to in some ways be leveled in terms of the racism that the society brings to bear on him. Um, I think there's another reason too, which, you know, quite frankly, you know, I've seen this film a few times, um, but I just picked it up and watching it this time, is early on when he's talking with Emmy and um, he's saying uh, that um, this is, um, that the Moroccans in, in Germany now are in a very bad state. They're looked down on because of what happened in Munich a couple of years before. And that, I think, pretty clearly is a direct reference to the Olympics at, in Munich when the Israeli um, athletes, two, I think two Israeli athletes were killed. So there's a sense in which, you know, what Fassbinder is up to here, I think, too, is, and this I find is crucial, the kind of melodrama that one sees in, let's say, the 1950s or before or whatever, Fassbinder is both histor is historicizing it and globalizing it in, 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 a, in a really distinctive way, I think. Yeah, and as I said at the beginning, too, he's also introducing elements that are not present in Cirque at all, like urban spaces, working class people, and questions of race. Um, Ali's ulcer and even the doctor's prognosis come straight out of uh, Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. Fanon understood that the prevalence of the stomach ulcer in Algerian men, he understood it in social terms as a disorder broadly caused by the pathology of atmosphere that accompanied the Algerian war. Why do you think this is significant in, the, in Cirque's, I mean, in Fassbinder's retelling of Cirque's story? Um, I, I think that there, there's a sense in which, um, you know, that kind of pathology of atmosphere at this point in the 70s is all over Germany as in some ways a more kind of global or European crisis, a crisis within the public spheres. So if we have in 1972, you have you know, the, the, the appearance of terrorists in Germany. You know, by 1977-78, that is of course when um, you have the, the Schleyer uh, Bader Meinhof group, the Steinheim, uh, Steinheim prison, uh, suicides of Bader and Schreier taking place. So throughout the, the 70s in Germany, I think that there's a sense of a kind of um, global crisis within the whole public sphere, not just of, of Germany, but of Europe, and perhaps even beyond that as well. And it's that kind of wartime crisis. You know, this is a, this is a country at war within its within its own borders at this point. Yeah. 
The film is, in, I think the audience would agree, but the film is roughly divided into two parts. The first part where the couple meets and falls in love, but are shunned by the community, and the second when they're embraced by those who earlier rejected them. The two parts are separated by, a, uh, the, separated the story by a vacation that's not represented at, in the plot. So what is, do you think is the significance of this narrative structure? Why does the film open with Emmy suspended in time and space, unattached, alone, in a zone of depoliticized individuality in many ways? And how does this, and does it end by situating her within a class context or not? Uh, I think so. I mean, it is interesting because there is a kind of transformation that takes place, I, I don't think too strangely, because, you know, not to be too, too precious about the whole thing, what I see happening in the second part when they come back from their vacation is people need them. <laughs> they need them, and in a very specific way, they need them in a financial way, a materialistic way. So, you know, as typical of Fassbinder, the, the problem with this, this, this social sphere that they're trying impossibly to integrate in is a social sphere de defined by a kind of capitalist economy. And that becomes clearer and clearer as the second part evolves. Yeah, this time watching it, I also thought, I, which I hadn't thought before, and perhaps you, you, maybe you disagree with me, but in that scene, in with the yellow chairs in the park where they're alone, and and there, of course, we've got the tableau of the of the staring people that reemerges at various points here, um, and she's just breaking down. She says, "I, you know." I'm so happy, but I've, I've never been, you know, so, so sad and, and um, people hate us and then we just, you know, need to get away, be on our own and when we come back it'll be better and, and she really breaks down and he's very tender with her and of course what the second part does in, in the way I was seeing it tonight, I kept thinking it's like Emmy really for the first time experiences racism um, indirectly and direct, you know, a kind of intolerance and prejudice, and finds it, you know, unbearable. But when they come back, you know, that hasn't changed. But somehow, with the transactional capitalist relationships, I need you to babysit my kid. Right, or I need, shop in my store. Yeah, or yeah, that um, it transforms for her, but it has never changed for him. No, never. And um, you know, I, I think at the heart of you know, a kind of uh, reductive formula for melodrama. It's always, you know, what, what drew Fassbinder to this, I think, so, so consistently, and I'm sure many of you know, he wrote that very famous uh, essay on uh, six films of Douglas Sirk. And what attracts him to it is the way in which he can, in some ways, integrate the kind of Brechtian distanciation within a more emotional framework. Um, and that, for him, is in some ways what you know, is integrating um, a kind of politics into Hollywood, a, po a politics into a Hollywood aesthetic of identification, emotion, individuality, and so forth. Um, and, you know, what happens is I think um, that they, be, they come to realize that this is, this is ultimately um, a crisis that is developed or it takes place within the context of this totally repressive um, social order, a public sphere of one sort or another. And, you know, at the heart of it is this incommensurability of emotion and love within that order at all. Um, you know, with, with, with Cirque, at the end of that film, you know, there's this sort of magical redemption at the end, um, a magical integration, or at least in some triumph of that emotional center. For Fassbinder, it never in some ways takes place. It never can take place in any of his films, I think. So how are the struggles of the black guest worker compared to those of the white charwoman? In what way does the film suggest that even the couple's love is socially determined and inexplicit, well, you just said, with the, their social positions? But she is, you know, she had married a Polish man, right? And so he's not a real German. Um, and I love the, you know, she is made to represent just the, on one hand, very kind and very open and understands why um, these Moroccans would want to hear their own music and be with their own people and things like that. And yet, um, 
when she, you know, her own racism kind of comes to the fore in the second half, where she treats him more like an object, look at touch his muscles, um, do this favor for me, go move my neighbor's stuff. And um, so I just wonder, you know, what we think about this juxtaposition in Fassbender's desire to talk about working classes, right? The beginning, their love, they both work. We work all the time. We're alone a lot. I'm alone a lot. Or, all, you know, in his case, I drink too much. And yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you, you know, clearly she's able to integrate um, much easier than he is because of the, the power of racism in the society. Um, that there is, you know, as I was saying before, I think that, you know, f what Fassbinder does is in some ways expand the terms of melodrama to be both historical and political. Um, and historical uh, in a film like this, but perhaps in all of Fassbinder's films, historical in a sense that always in some ways rings back to World War II. So you have these strange sort of references to mm -hmm. You know, she, she, her husband was part of the Hitler party. She was part of the Hitler party. They go to a restaurant where Hitler, you know, these are not throwaway parts because for Fassbinder, you know, it's that the legacy of the German legacy of fascism, which still is being played out here. And of course, Emmy in some ways at least has um, a foot in that, I think, at of this point. Of course, it's like, yeah. Yeah, where she's, I mean, on the one hand, she's more enlightened than many of her neighbors. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you know, when it comes out, you know, we don't eat couscous in this country. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Couscous and, isn't German. And, um, and you know, for Fassmann, the you know, the, the tragedy of life and the, the, in some ways, vehicle for repression is having emotions, is having love. You know, as long as you can stay away from that, which means staying away from the melodramatic in many ways, um, you can be a functioning member of this society in a way. But soon as in some ways you start to articulate or, or act on emotions like love and need and desire and so forth, you become immediately in some ways victimized by the machine that is society here. Um, and you know, I think stylistically it's, um, it's really, really a great film in terms of the way he uses you know, the absence of eye lines. Instead, you have these, these almost surreal lineups of groups staring in a way that would make anybody uncomfortable, but especially somebody who is trying to, in some ways, articulate emotion or love or need. Um, and then, you know, secondly, the way the, that couple is constantly being framed mm -hmm. in long shots and through different frames in some ways, there is there's a, a sense in which that their emotions, uh, their loves, their desires are constantly in some ways being repressed within the framework, the visual framework of the society. You know, probably most <laughs> dramatically, beautifully, horrifically, when they're having that celebration lunch at, the, at Hitler's restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, and it is set up kind of like a tableau. Yeah. And, they, and you know, the restaurant is empty, so it is like they are alone in the world. And, and she, of course, the, you know, the, the waiter is being very, uh, you know, demeaning towards her and, you know, clearly, you know, like everybody else, looking on as spectators and are disgusted by what they see. And yet, you know, Fassbender pulls out for the view in a very Brechtian kind of way yeah. to take us back to where they are in this in this. Yeah, point. and I mean, if you think just in terms of those, those eyeline shots, um, you know, this is too simplistic, but the sense of which are sort of shot counter shots and eyeline matches are the way of, in some ways, creating a kind of emotional dynamic between Bogart and Bacall or whomever, um, that's completely completely undermined in this, this, this but except perhaps in that scene when they're in the, the, um, the garden having lunch, yeah. except perhaps in that scene. Yeah, but even that is a scene, I mean, on the one hand, it's, the kind, of, it's kind of idyllic and they're in the garden and they're, again, they're once they're alone and surrounded by all these yellow chairs and we know in this, on the side are, you know, this again, the tableau of the naysayers and, and she starts screaming at them. And again, it's like her first, she's truly internalized. Why does everybody hate right. us? You know, right, right. Uh, and all she wants is a kind of Circean, um, idealistic moment 
an idol of some sort where they can be alone. And, and you know, of course, in Cirque, you get that. Whether you believe in it or not, that's another question. But in Fassbinder, you never get that. Um, you never get that. Um, that or at least if you get that kind of idealistic moment, um, that kind of idyllic moment in Fassbinder between two individuals expressing desire, um, it is fairly quickly destroyed <laughs> by, the, by the social mechanisms around them. So what do you make of, or what are we to make of Barbara, played by Barbara Valentine, who plays the blonde propi proprietor of the asphalt pub? What's her function here? Uh, good question. <laughs> uh, I'm not entirely sure, except, um, you know, she does at that one moment when she delivers a drink, I believe she says something like, yeah. I'm the owner. Yeah. And By the way. By the way, I'm the owner. Um, and, you know, as the movie proceeds, I think, you know, I'm the owner um, is in some ways a way for her establishing her relationship to um, Ali, which are, as we know, both sexual, but also financial, <laughs> financial. And, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's about the best I can do with No, her. I think this, I think this, I mean, having lived in Berlin um, for a year, and I did walk into pubs like that. It felt like that, like, yeah. where you walk in and everybody just is staring at you and it's kind of shabby and weird, and you're like, hello. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But you know, the whole film is sort of full of these spaces and places which might offer the possibility of a kind of community, private community, um, social harmony and so forth, but they become almost, the more that they become associated with a particular social group, they become increasingly hostile. Mm -hmm. They're hostile spaces. You're either in or you're not in. Um, and in a way, you know, what, you know, the tragedy of, of Ali and Emmy is they don't necessarily want to be in, they just want to be left alone. But there's no being left alone in Fassbinder's world. Um, and, and, but his characters are just tortured by their need to be loved, their need to have desires, um, but there's no space for them. There's no place for them. There's no bar they can go into. I was struck tonight when I was watching, again, with uh, Barbara from the Asphalt Pub, <clears throat> when Ali comes in and his buddies are not there yet, and he orders a small beer and, uh, and then invites you know, uh, his friend to come to, to his place and, and um, there's the altercation with the other woman who's jealous or whatever. And then he goes out and the other of his friends are out, they're just about to come into the pub, but why don't you come to my place? And there's the close up of Barbara. It's like, this is taking away her business. These yeah. people are paying customers and yeah. now they're gonna go over to this flat. Um, yeah, and you know, that's I think one of those threads that runs through this is, you know, it's, it's really profitable to be a racist until it's not profitable in this film. Right, as we uh, see with the grocer. And, yeah. Yeah, and the willfully not understanding. Again, I had experiences like that. Um, this is my last question before we will open up for audience questions, but some critics have argued that uh, Ali Fear Eats the Soul depends on the recognition of the shared interests of workers and different, of different races and ethnicities. This, say, they say, is in stark contrast to Cirque, where hope resides in the pastoral vision of a simple commodity-producing society. What do you think motivated Fassbender to make this particular Cirque film? He wrote on Six, mm. but to make this particular Cirque film when he did. Um, does Fassbender demand that the cinema be act? He, he, he demands that it be actively thought as well as felt, thought and felt, and in what way is this a departure from Cirque himself? I mean, I'm wondering, why do you think Fassbender picked this particular film? Um, well, I um, think, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, assuming here, but I think, you know, because of that particular, you know, if you look at other Cirque films, like Imitation of Life, which I think he writes about, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. that is more explicitly about um, race and uh, the problems of race within a melodramatic formula. Uh, written on the wind, how could he do that outside of Texas? Yeah. Right, right. Oh. That's, 
and without oil wells, you can't really do that. <laughs> you can't really. Um, but you know, the the all that heaven allows is, I think, um, very explicitly about class, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's that kind of social structure that I think Fassbinder really wanted to draw out here in terms of um, not just class, but in terms of politics and history as well. Um, but you know, in some ways, class. Racism, politics, and history are what, uh, for me, Fassbinder expands out of yes. the Cirque film. Um, so it just draws it into a larger, a larger framework, which still has its kind of class framework in a way, but much less so, I think. Right, because of course, in the All That Heaven Allows, in some ways, these class differences are, you know, they're pretty minimal. Do you want a mid-century right, modern right. house? Right, right, and if you're, you I mean, if you're colonial? gonna. If you're Jane Wyman and you're going to fall in love with your gardeners, that seems a little less severe if it's Rock Hudson. Well, you know, that's, that's there's more, always that. There's more acceptable. But I mean, I think that's important though too, because these are not characters that um, Fassbinder can romanticize as outsiders. Right. They're so dramatically, visually not within a kind of romanticized mainstream at all, and so it, it really does accentuate their otherness. I think in this group. Well, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Tyler Morgensen, our assistant director at the center, and he is going to tell the audience how we're handling the Q&A. Thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, so I, I just had this one little thing that I'd love to hear you comment on, uh, thinking about uh, Cirque and Fassbender and, and, and love and connection and Hollywood and capitalism, or whatever. Okay. Um, in uh, uh, in um, All That Heaven Allows, uh, the children give the widow, mm -hmm. played by Jane Wyman, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a television set so that she won't be lonely. I mean, they're not going to hang around. They've got their own lives. So they give her a television set. And we just see her just like looking at the like television set. In this, the kids killer television set. Right. <laughs> so I just thought that was like such an interesting twist here. I'd yeah. just love to hear your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, no, that, that is, and I, I was hoping somebody would ask about that because it is, you know, it's clearly a reference to that in an explicit way, but it's also in some ways a mark of distance in some ways. With the Cirque film, that television set becomes a kind of sad... Object in this. Object of, of integration. Well, she is... Um, we have to keep her in the domestic sphere here and keep her distracted by television uh, in some ways as a kind of, I guess, way of repressing her desires of one sort or another. If she's watching TV, she can't be hanging out with Rock Hudson, I guess. Um, this television becomes the object of violence, violence. And this film, certainly compared to the Cirque film, is just full visually visually full of violence, you know, those stairs, um, those, the spaces themselves. So not, there's not necessarily any, I think, um, explicit graphic violence that we would associate with this film that I can think of, um, except, of course, towards the end when he collapses, if that is. But, um, but this is a much more violent world than Cirque's. And for me, maybe that's in some ways the the, the, the gesture that is, um, we are a violent society. We're not one that's going to just distract you with the bourgeois technology. Okay. I also think, just to add on to that, I also think that in All That Heaven Allows, it's not just, it's, it's when she's agreed and acceded to her children's wishes that she not be with Ron Kirby. And they get her this television, they know, and she's incredibly lonely. Christmas and her, she's, her face is reflected into the television. I feel like when the Fassbinder, I agree with you, it is a much more violent and you know, she has these two sons. The thing is in Cirque, the kids and the whole, it, it, it's not even a class difference. They don't, mothers don't have sex. Right. It, it, so she, they, don't, they can't imagine that she'd want to have, that is disgusting to them. Where in, in all the, and Ali, of course, that's not the issue. They, they may be disgusted, she's too old, but 
And so they kick the television. If you watch carefully, though, the television moves spaces. Like, like it's even before the sun pays for it. Um, and we were laughing because Tim, before he saw it again, thought maybe it was Fassbender yeah. who plays the son-in-law. Fassbender, and that was kick the television. But I, re I remember it being the son. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I don't know why I thought it was Fassbender who kicks it. It in. would just make some but, kind of. You sense. know, that's a whole other discussion. Is how. Fassbinder self presents himself in these films, God, and yeah. it's always as kind of some grubbery, you know, desperate, mean spirited figure, you know, somebody who's from the underworld or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's a whole nother discussion, I think. Thank you. I just wanted to elaborate a bit on the uh, uh, the kind of aesthetic in the film. I mean, um, Douglas Sirk famously was. Uh, shooting scenes all the time with mirrors and reflections, right? And I was watching this film, and I noticed that every scene has a mirror, right? Mm. It's it's in the bathroom. It's uh, you know on, on on in the bathroom of the woman who is uh, you know welcoming Ali and so on and so forth. And at the end, there is this incredible gigantic mirror that is framing the entire hospital and all the ward and you know and all the beds uh, and it's almost like the reversal of the kind of views that Sirk is making of mirrors in his own you know films um, I just wanted I thought you know we might elaborate on that yeah I'm not sure Patrice you may have something to say about that but it's you know in this this use of mirrors in many ways um, I think travels through most of Fassbinder's films in the in the um, 70s, um, and it's certainly related to the notion of framing. But you know, it's it's um, Fassbinder's characters are always, in some ways, very um, they they inhabit very very fragile identities. I would say very fragile identities, and there's a constant kind of introspection or um, um, self-searching that goes on in these films. Um, you know, regardless of the mirrors, but you know, I see the mirrors in some ways as a kind of um, prop. In some ways, calls attention to that uh, uh, fragility of identity and the search for it in these films. I don't know if Patricia you have other thoughts. No, I think about that's that. about right. I mean, to me, there is the same you know mirroring, but what's so different here with the tableau of the onlookers, again, and you know, constantly. Even you know in the morning when they both go out to work, and then of course that landlady's head comes out as she watches them at six thirty in the morning go their separate. So the, you know your the sense that you're always being watched. But in mm. the like in the bathroom scene when Emmy says you know you, and he's showering, she says you are so beautiful. Right. You know so that it's also it's not the same kind of looking that goes on from that we see on the streets or from people who are um, hostile towards foreigners and um, outsiders. Hi, thanks so much. This is the first time I've seen a Fassbinder film. Uh, you've Cheers. got many good things <laughs> ahead of you. I, on the note of how violence is permeating within milieus, I found it kind of funny that the policemen were yeah. very... Um, Did you see his hair? Long hair. Uh, yeah. And the landlord in his own way, uh, yeah. although he threatens violence in the sense of evicting until he hears that they're going to be married. I'm just curious to hear what was he maybe thinking because when I think of violence, especially in a state, landlords and police are probably <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. involved. <laughs> Yeah, I, I gotta say, I'm not quite sure what to say about that, particularly the landlord, and when the two women are making all these snarky comments about them. And this, this is a sequence that is highlighted, pretty much, where he says, well, what's wrong? They're, they seem like a happy couple. Right. Uh, that seems to me to come out of nowhere, and it's almost as if it's an editorial insert or something into this. That's the best I can do with that. It's really, because it does sort of stand out as opposed to, you know, the, the you know, sort of uh, general ugliness of this, so, of the social groups around them, that these people, there are people there who say, you know, they're just in love. Right, but I think, it, I would also say, though, that I love it's like the landlord, is, uh, the landlord and the, uh, um, 
we were talking about the landlord who, who who doesn't evict them. Oh, you're married. Okay, then that's all fine. Paragraph two, you're not having a lodger. Or when the police, there's a kind of, at least what I saw, there's an element, a kind of, you know, a kind of misogyny that these all these women are complaining. And the cops and the landlord, they have to follow their rule book, but they really don't want to hear all this bickering and gossiping. And, you know, so they're... There is this kind of their response to ha constantly having to respond to these complaints and critiques of foreigners and their music or a lodger or the stairs are dirtier. And they just want to do their job and go home. Right. And, you know, it's, it's true that, you know, in, from one point of view, the, the police and the landlord, as you were suggesting, they're at the top of the social structure. Yeah. You know, they're, they, they um, in some ways, you know, they, they have the power. Um, so there may be something about that there, too. That they don't have to get involved in the, the, the messiness of the street life. Maybe. <laughs> Anyways, thanks, everybody, for yes, coming Yes, thank you tonight. very much. And Tim, Tim will be here tomorrow. Tyler Morgenstern has organized um, a roundtable on film criticism. It promises to be really interesting. So if you're interested in that, join us tomorrow in the Annenberg at 3. Okay, okay thank you.